Stream the full series on ABC iView. Tonight, who are governments governing for? A panel of economic heavy hitters are here to answer your questions. Yanis Yaroufakis was the finance minister for Greece, who's now warning governments of the pervasive power of the tech giants. American economist Stephanie Kelton says not all government debt is bad debt. Journalist Joe Aston, who's applied the blowtorch to corporations like Qantas. Industry and Science Minister Ed Husick wants to curb the power of big tech, while key Senator Jackie Lambie has pushed for more relief for households struggling with the cost of living. Welcome to Q&A. I'm Patricia Carvellis. I want to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we are meeting. Remember, you can live stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quandra is the hashtag. Please get involved. To get us started tonight, here's a question from Zabeda uh, Cormax. Good evening. In what ways could the economic power and global reach of tech giants undermine or challenge the authority of national governments? Giannis. This is nothing new. Uh, the great conglomerates that emerged at the beginning of the 20th century, I think of you know, Thomas Edison and Westinghouse, and, you know, Krupp in Germany, they always had more power than the presidents and the prime ministers. This is not what is new. What I find new and very worrying, and that's what I try to bring to the attention of not governments, but citizens primarily, is that now there's a new form of capital, machinery. You know, when Henry Ford created the production lines for the Model T and so on, the machinery that was using was produced in order to produce other stuff, like the Model T. But now what's inside your phone, again, is machinery, but its business is to modify our behaviour and to create whole platforms in which consumers, capitalists, are all vassals, are all, we are all drawn into this. They are not working on behalf of producers. They are capturing producers, they are capturing polities, they are algorithmic capital, extracts gigantic rents, you know, um, money, without producing anything. They are not producing anything. They are modifying our behaviour. So the moment you enter Amazon.com, you've exited capitalism. You've exited the market. That's not a market. Okay. It looks like a market. It looks like a market. So but what is it? it's not a market. What is it? It's... Look, th think about it. It's like a fiefdom made of digital algorithmic capital. The moment you step in it, you cannot talk to anyone, to anyone, unless the algorithm of Jeff Bezos matches you with, with a producer so as to maximise the amount of value that it extracts from you and from the producer. And that value is extracted from the circular flow of income, from the economy, mm. which means that demand for goods and services goes down, jobs become BS, this is a scientific term, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and we have stagnation and very low actual investment in the things that society needs. Okay, so there so you are. This is different to what we had 100 years it, ago. There has been a shift. Joe Aston, in fact, it was today that the head of Australia's biggest bank, the Commonwealth Bank, made the point that the focus should be on regulating big tech, not focusing on Australian companies like banks, because big tech is where the focus should be. Jeez, we can't do two things at once. We'll just do both of them, feeding. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, nice one of the there's a point there that everyone in this debate is talking their own book when, when one party is saying to about another counterparty, regulate them. This has been going on forever. Uh, but, you know, the big tech companies, what, they're, they're still... It's been 11 years since the G20 made its focus, uh, I think it was in St Petersburg, uh, making these companies pay tax at the source of their income. Uh, and that's what the whole PwC tax leak scandal was about last year. And, and they still don't. I mean, the, the major technology companies pay just a, a negligible amount of, of company tax in Australia. Uh, so that's, that's one of the ways in which we completely fail to regulate them, still. Right. OK. 
Ed Hughes, who kill the minister. Uh, you how do you? It all up? Yeah. <laughs> how do you begin to begin the project of regulating them? And can and at the essence of the question is, can national governments be have have sway? Can actually have they have influence? Uh, I think uh, on a number of levels, it's got to operate. I, uh, I think it's very difficult for individual governments uh, to do so. I think one of the turning points in my mind, having followed this space for a similar amount of time, is what Joe was reflecting on a few moments ago around the taxation arrangements of big tech. Uh, and it was something that I, I did focus on as a parliamentarian and particularly the way it had an interplay in pricing of products. Uh, it was uh, certainly evident to me back then that unless you got governments to work together and agree to work together, you wouldn't really go anywhere quickly. And in the last, in particular, the last few months, um, I went to this uh, AI Safety Summit in London uh, back in November, 30 countries there. It was the first time countries had actually taken seriously the need to look at what's going to be done around AI, particularly because, not just because of the tech, but what it does in terms of powering companies and the wealth of those companies and the influence of those companies as well. And so I think we've gone through a bit of a turning point. Um, there'll always be a question, there'll always be someone saying, we've got to do it faster, we should have done it yesterday. Uh, is there an appetite that. for regulation? Uh, well, I think uh, across well a number of areas, if you look at it, be it in, you know, what we're seeing right now with the way that Meta is trying to effectively you know, thug the situation around the news media bargaining code. OK, OK, uh, so that's it, a particular example. Albeit, albeit What's your power AA? there? AI. Um, well, in, in that case, it's basically us determining where we go to within the framework of the media bargaining laws and whether or not uh, Meta gets designated. Uh, and that will require them to come to the bargaining table. Uh, that's got to be worked through, as, as well as on the AI side, making sure that um, these companies aren't going ahead uh, doing whatever they want, mm. regardless of risk. They've got to be able to take into account what impact their products have on the rest of the country. Are Meta acting like thugs? Well, I think they've just basically got used to this um, uh, approach. They did this a couple of years ago. They withdrew their services. Um, you know, they basically got hounded back uh, in. They're doing it to the Canadians in one shape or form or another. And it's really up to governments to be able to tag team because mm -hmm. the effects of what they're doing, particularly around social media and the potential for disinformation as well on their platforms, that is serious in terms of the operation of democracies in a year where about half the world's population is going to be going on election. Mm. Jackie Lambie, do you think Meta are thugs? Are you worried about the power that they have? Yeah, they're bloody thugs. They're like the banks. <laughs> Let's be honest, they've got way too much power and you need to do something. I've got kids out there that are highly addicted to this sort of stuff and it is getting worse and it needs to be shut down. The misinformation, especially around... Um, especially you see that going on uh, around political elections, things like that. This has got to be stopped. These guys need to be fined. Or stand up to them and say, get out then. Get yeah. out. OK, but if you send them out, Stephanie, is that like, can you do that? Well, you could do it. I mean, we just had in the US uh, a hearing, one of many, and, you know, there's a lot of bipartisan interest in mm. this subject, yeah. and they lined up the CEOs of Facebook yeah, and Twitter X and Snapchat and TikTok and, mm. you know, sat these men and women down, and one after another, members of the, you know, U.S. Senate said, this is a bill I've co-sponsored with, and each of the bills was co-sponsored with someone from the other political party. So the politicians are out there, they're saying, we've got all of these things we'd like to do, and then the question was to the CEO, do you support this legislation? And one after another, they went down the list and said, Senator, I'm not prepared to support that legislation today. As if you're asking them for the permission slip to regulate yeah. them. This is the problem. Right. So the, the US situation is, the, is where the rubber hits the road. The online harm uh, movement in Congress, if they really nail uh, particularly Meta, um, on, this on this particular issue, they have the potential to be treated as the next tobacco. But the Australian government isn't doing anything serious. I mean, the news m bargaining media code is, is, I mean, the amount of money we're talking about is risible. Uh, Meta is choosing not to pay $70 million anymore. I mean, what's That's that? $70 million. Them, right? I mean, I think Josh Frydenberg spent that much on car parks in Kuyong that were never built. <laughs> it's a, if, 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 the, if you're solving for a problem, in the news media bargaining code that Australian journalism so is somehow So what would you do if you were in charge? Well, I'm not in charge. That's, well, why, that's why I get to sit in the cheap seats and just <laughs> opine constantly. Hey, that's but... not a cheap seat. <laughs> Honestly, though, what should they do? Well, well can I yeah. give one example to the minister in particular? How about charging 
a tax, a digital tax on the revenues of every transaction. Every time anyone pays Facebook money in order to promote their event, their political views, their you know, commercial activities, they should be charged some like 5% on the revenue. That is on the revenue side of things. You cannot regulate the content because let's face it, the managers of Facebook do not understand the algorithms. It's a bit like in the banking system the, with the CDOs, with those uh, weapons of mass financial d destruction that uh, blew up and, you know, the world of finance and brought us the GFC. The very financial engineers that was, were creating those derivatives didn't know what was, you know, the mathematical formulas within it. So unless we take a view that this kind of capital, which I call cloud capital, algorithmic capital, call, call, it, call it what you may, is a serious threat to our society, our social fabric, our economy, our effective demand, our tax base, mm. and go in a very radical direction, which I'm going to propose now, to say to Facebook, if you want to operate in Australia, you are going to have to deposit a certain percentage of your shares in an Australian sovereign fund, and therefore acquire returns to capital, as well as voting power, inside that corporation. And if you don't want it, you can bugger off. Is that something this, that you... What, oh, oh, it's just a, there's this one small problem, uh, and that is that Facebook would destroy the Australian government, just like the mining companies did to the Australian government. But that's a, a recipe for simply giving up on the smidgen of an iota of a possibility of democracy. But this is the power you're talking about. Yeah, you're talking sure. about incredibly powerful companies. That's why politics is say... irreplaceable. It's not a technical fix. Right. I'm interested in that. You say it would destroy the government. Well, that's what, I, that's what I would do if I was... That's how I would respond if I was in that position. And that is why the government, any government, has a duty to the Australian people to organise politically a democratic, a democratic debate for resisting but, those... Um... But Joe reckons they can't win it. Ed, can you win it? I uh, have to say I've looked at a number of industries where, uh, yeah, their actions have got the backs of people up. Um, you know, I, I fought a few years ago against the gas sector over the prices that they were charging. Uh, there's only so far you could push. Uh, but tech is different in this country and I think in most political environments and picking up on Stephanie's point in the US, um, there's a lot more focus on doing something about tech quite distinct to other sectors. Mm. Mm. And quick, quick question. Joe used the term tobacco and I was like, do you see them as like big tobacco? Uh, Joe says a lot of things I just <laughs> take on board. Joe, are they like big tobacco? Well, if you think about uh, what are people, what are, what are parents at home concerned about, and uh, I say this, I'm not a parent, but as I understand it, the things that people are, are, are concerned about at home about technology companies is one, what are they doing to our children, and, uh, particularly yeah. in you know in terms of body image, um, hmm. and yep. really a, a huge and irreversible emotional damage to the next generation. Two, the bastards don't pay any tax where they where they make their income. Um, and that can't be fixed uh, easily because the other countries want that income, you know, the fight is... But weird. you can still tax sales here in Australia done through the internet. OK. Yeah. And Facebook in particular. Yeah. Well, because right. right now Australians are paying. You, you're, we're Indonesia paying. We're going to pay it. for the damage now. That's what we're doing because they're not paying because they have no moral compass. All right. That's where we're at. That gets us to the topic of our online poll. We're asking you, should Australian regulators attempt to curb the economic and political power of big tech companies like Meta? You can cast your votes anonymous, anonymously on the Q&A Facebook and YouTube accounts or the ABC News X and Instagram account. accounts. We'll bring you the results <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice thing. On the Facebook account. Uh, you can <laughs> vote on their account. Oh, gosh. <laughs> we should have really thought about that, guys. Uh, next, At we'll hear from Jane. Show, you invited interruptions, so you can't really... We, we invite interruptions, not heckling, though, Ed <laughs> Our next question comes from Jane Hasler. Great. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, good evening. My question is for the panel. Uh, I'm part of the dying breed of people that's lived a large chunk of their lives without technology. As such, I feel a responsibility to protect our younger persons mm. from, tech from harm caused by tech companies. I believe we need to promote critical thinking, sport and creativity uh, in the school system and in the wider population. Uh, would you agree with this and can you please offer some of your 
uh, suggestions around important actions that need to prevent this harm. Thank so, you. So, Jane, you're concerned about the impact that social media is essentially having on Correct. young people. Yeah. What, yeah do you think, what do you think it's doing to young people? Well, uh, as a sociologist and a parent of eight children, my husband and I have eight children, ranging from 35 down to 18, we've seen firsthand some harm that can be done, and that is the dopamine that can be released, you know, for younger persons. It's very hard for them to get off the technology. Um, we have cyberbullying. We have... Uh, the um, people competing uh, amongst other people on Facebook uh, and that leads to depression and anxiety. And we have a whole range of issues that are really confronting us and we need to really, as a society, step up and say we need to really uh, protect our younger persons and that's what we feel strongly, my husband and myself so, and many other people. So taking it to the panel, Jackie, how do you even start to deal with so many layers of issues? Well, all the schools around Australia can start making them put them and put their phones in their bags first thing in the morning and they're not allowed, allowed to bring them out to the afternoon. We all went through school without phones. I think, you know, that would give them a good eight hours off for the day. That would be a good start. But you are right, the addiction... I mean, parents out there wrote about alcohol and drug abuse and addiction. I tell you what, watch your kids with tech because uh, they are getting addicted. Uh, they're staying up late of a night time. They're not going to school. This is the next generation of addiction. I'm very grateful. I'm a little bit like you. My, my boys are a little bit older. They missed all that. Uh, so they, the only thing they use, they have a phone for uh, phone calls and um, texting. But these younger kids out there, some of those horrific stories that I'm hearing and uh, what they're going through, and it is an addiction. You can see them. It takes two or three days. They, they, it's no different to watching them come off drugs or alcohol. I kid you not. I've watched this recently and uh, watching these, the, the performance, uh, you know, this is how bad they're getting. They are putting holes in walls, the same as drugs and alcohol. They are hitting their parents. This is the addiction. This is tech addiction. This is real. This is what it's doing to these young kids. Uh, I think that lots of people have anecdotal evidence for the way it's impacting their families, for sure. But how do you how do you deal with it at a regulatory or, or you know real level to try and stop it? I mean, it seems like it's just story after story of parents frustrated. What do you do? I think that it is largely up to parents. And if we could get schools mm. to do more, because the tech companies themselves aren't doing it, and we know that the algorithms are feeding different kinds of content to kids in different countries. I mean, I have a 16-year-old daughter, and so I know how much time she's on her phone, but I also know, thank goodness, that she and some of her friends are aware of the, the dangers, and they're aware of what it can do to mm. some of their friends. They launched a podcast. I watched one of the episodes that she and two other girls recorded really recently where they're talking the whole episode was about social media and the downsides of social media. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that they'll talk to one another about it. I think it probably doesn't happen nearly as often as we'd like, but the, the onus is on us for the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. Ed? I'd certainly, and pick up on a point that Joe raised earlier around the online harms movement in the, the US, uh, it's certainly been something that we've focused on. Uh, my colleague Michelle Rowland is starting to lead that work on developing... Uh, a response on those issues so that we can hold some of these firms to account because they do need to be held to account if they're, in particular, shaping algorithms in ways that are leading people, similar to what Stephanie just mentioned, um, in terms of the content that's coming forward and just continuing to do that. We've seen that in other platforms as well. YouTube, for example, had big issues uh, a few years ago uh, and had to be pressured to take that seriously in terms of the way its algorithm was feeding up content that was extremist in nature. Uh, and I think there's going to have to be a similar sort of thing that will happen with social media uh, as well to be, you know, part of that, you know, being accountable and solving this issue. OK. Provocative question. But, Joe, have we... Have we... Honestly, have we... Are we too late? Yes. Like, it feels like we're too late. Yes. Have you tried to take a phone off a teenager? I have not. I wish you luck. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. No, the genie's out of the bottle. We do have to be realistic about that. There is no going back to the days of your, you know, it's... So you got to work with it. So what do you do? Well... You tax them. No, no, no. <laughs> taxation is not going to solve this problem. <laughs> no, uh, it's not. But one, thing you, one, th one thing you could do is you could um, school kids to create their own algorithms on the basis of their own principles and values. So 
you know, to create their own algorithm communities outside of Facebook, outside of the big tech companies, whose algorithms, I mean, the, the algorithm itself is not the problem, but an algorithm that has been created in order to create hatred and to create uh, addiction, that is the problem. So it's a question of property rights. Who owns the algorithm? If you have, imagine you had, you know, the local library together with local schools saying, okay, here's a project, we'll create our own algorithm for discussing amongst ourselves and uh, picking topics and highlighting them in a way that we collectively have agreed that is the right way of communicating. But Patricia, allow me to, to bring another dimension which concerns me regarding young people. The death of the liberal individual, of the autonomous person. I have noticed in universities and talking to young people over the last few years, that because, think of Google, right? All those, you know, all singing, all dancing, big tech companies in Silicon Valley. You go in there, um, they have very pleasant architecture, they have uh, ping pong tables. It, it's very appealing to young people and they all want a job there because these are the good jobs, not the BS jobs. Mm. Now, just you know, looking at my daughter, you know, when she was 16, 16, 17, I could see that subconsciously she, her friends, were very worried about what they were uploading on TikTok, on Snapchat and all that, because they knew deep down, subconsciously, that one day, when they go for a job interview, mm. some bot, mm. or maybe a person, or a person that remind, resembles a bot, is going to interview them after having checked yes, all yes, their online yep. history. So there is no separation like we used to have between yep. work and play, mm. between messing around and doing things that will come to haunt you during job interviews. Mm. That, for me, is just a, a machine creating angst amongst the young regarding their future. Mm. And that is something that we should tackle. Surveilling them, basically, throughout their entire lives. And also putting them in a situation of self-censorship at the age of 16 without even realising it. Mm. That's a very powerful point. We'll keep this discussion going with a question from Aidan Nguyen. This, this question's on intergenerational equity. The, the idea that we can leave behind promises and opportunities that are as good, if not better, for the next generation than the current. It feels like it's fundamentally under threat from the way our current economic system has been set up, particularly the way we've designed our property and economic incentives. Does the panel agree? And if so, what needs to change? Joe? Oh, cracky. Um, well, uh, housing is, is uh, property is, is difficult is very difficult and it's a bit like technology. The genie's out of the bottle and we're not going back to the days where houses cost you know, three times average income. So um, if your objective is to own a house in inner Sydney or inner Melbourne and you do not have access to the bank of mum and dad, you are screwed and, um, and I would change your objective. And that's unfortunate, but again, like one of those things we can pretend that, governments will continue to pretend that they're trying to change it. But no government actually wants house prices to fall. Uh, that would be quite a problem for all the voters who own houses, uh, for them with all the, all the voters who own houses. So uh, the, that, that, it, it's, it's a real tragedy. Uh, the, I think in terms of the incentives of, of equity, I think uh, this country massively overtaxes. I'm, I'm already, can't believe I'm saying this in front with two economists on the panel, but massively overtaxes uh, wages. And um, let's let's and under taxes assets and the income and assets. And you heard through that whole stage three tax cuts, there was a lot of class based language around uh, how they were tax cuts for the rich. But the truth is that the the that the rich, the real rich, and I understand why someone making two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand dollars a year seems rich to someone who's making forty thousand dollars a year. But the truth is that the real rich in this country, they don't uh, work for uh, salaries. They they uh, they earn income in two ways, on the increase in the valuation of their assets and on the income those assets throw off. And that, those, and that income is taxed at a far lower rate than workers who are working for a wage. And I think that is, uh, is a structural problem with the Australian tax system. Unfortunately, the bad news is that no, uh, no government will seriously try and change it because it's a great way to lose uh, elections. Because it's, <laughs> it's a suicide note, isn't it, yeah. to your election campaign? Jackie Lambie, uh, 
you're not quite running for Prime Minister. You're a crossbencher, so you can kind of... You've got a little more... Oh, it's early, PK. It's just uh, early. Yeah. I've got a few more years left in here. Can you declare your ambitions to run for <laughs> Prime Minister here tonight? Um, Do we need to get bold and, and look at changing the tax arrangements? Um... We need to do something about the tax arrangements, there's no doubt about that, but we also need to do something about the arrangements up here and down here, and I'll explain that quickly. Up here, we have uh, public servants, senior public servants out there, and uh, chiefs of our Defence Force are earning twice as much as a Prime Minister. So you tell me how you work that out. Uh, we've got universities out there that have gone into the red and they've all given themselves... Those, those vice-chancellors have given themselves pay rises. That's what they're doing while their staff are screaming out uh, for pay rises themselves. You know, that's what we're looking at. And then we've got down here with these kids. These kids, once upon a time, could go and afford to pay, play sport. Now, to play sport, you can be looking at... I think it was $750 that I heard an 11-year-old old girl in Canberra was paying to play for soccer for 20 games this year. Where are those... You know, what happens to those families who can't afford that? That's without the gear. That's without um, representing your state, which costs more. Once upon a time, you could go to a small business if you had one of your kids representing the state and the small business would give you a small donation of $100 or $50. Well, small business can't afford to do that either. So I've got a big problem from down here. I believe that while those kids are in primary school, especially primary school, they should not be playing for sports and the state government should be picking that up. But let's get the priorities right here, up the top here. Because when I'm seeing vice-chancellors that are failing to get their jobs done are failing to get those kids back in those universities and are giving themselves pay rises, I have a problem with so that. So you have like an said. issue with wage inequity? I have a, an issue with wage inequity. How about property inequity, that point that Joe made, though? Because that, that's true. Assets, they make money. And then you give them to your kids and then they keep making money. And it's intergenerational, right? That's the, that's the story. Whereas wage earners, it might be high, but that's it. Yes. Yeah, so... But like you said, it's like unless you've got a rich, unless you've come from a rich family, um, those assets aren't being passed down. Let's be honest with you. We certainly don't have that. We're not Sydney and Melbourne in Tasmania. We don't have a lot of rich parents down there. They're surviving. They're taking their money into aged care so they can finish off comfortably. They don't have much left for their kids. So we do have a problem. We have a housing issue out there. And like you said, it's completely out of control. We have lost control out of that. And we need to do something about it. And we're still arguing about how and where we're building these houses. That's where we're at. Ed Husey, do we need a fundamental re-shake-up conversation? I know you're not going to declare sort of a new tax policy tonight, but do you think that there's... Well, Go on. you know, let's... You can, <laughs> but I, I'm living in reality. Um, to address this intergenerational... Well, we just went through a pretty big tax change uh, just over the last few months uh, that um, uh, attracted quite a bit of uh, criticism in terms of reshaping... Stage three, and that's on top of what we've done uh, on multinational tax reform and superannuation reform uh, as well. So I think we've got a lot, you know, on the on the books as we uh, as we speak and getting through all that. Um, being a generational side, though, just addressing Aidan's uh, point is a serious one. I mean, we're looking at both short-term and long-term fixes on that. Um, a lot of people have felt like they've been stuck with the same wage for way too long and never saw their wages move. And we were actually a government that said, we want to see better. And wages are now growing way better than they have for years. We're promised, but well, I, compared to where they're oh. at, compared to where they're at, doing better, they can always, always people yeah. will want to do better. And I get that. But for years we lived under conservative governments that said wages would improve and they did nothing about it and they never actually changed. And we also wanted to make sure that we made other changes through the taxation arrangements just mentioned. I think the big thing is going, going to housing as well. Um, it is complex, and I'll take on board Joe's point, because you're going to have a whole bunch of people once prices start to go down that get nervous about it. But one of the other big things to try and deal with affordability is to actually increase the number of homes. I see that in my part of the world in Western Sydney, uh, and increasingly um, people will not be able to move into the city um, they're moving further and further out west. And I've seen the edge of Sydney mm. continue to move. But we are trying to address that housing affordability issue because it's one of the big drivers on your point about intergenerational uh, differences when it comes to housing. And I've got to say, I take on board the point about um, some people handing down houses uh, from one generation to the next, next, but I'm from Western Sydney. I'm no magnate. So <laughs> I, I, I don't see necessarily that that... That does happen, but I do genuinely, genuinely get concerned when I see the cost of 
homes in my part of the world where I've grown up and know how those prices have moved and we do need to uh, make a change on that and we are trying to do it both for housing, in terms of housing affordability and helping renters to actually buy their first home. Aidan? Which is a demand side. What, what concerns you about this? Are you Suppose. able to get into the property market? So, uh, look, um, for, for me, yes, we've been, we've been lucky. Me and my partner, um, I think, very lucky to have secure, well-paid jobs. Um, but, you know, when I look at my friends, my peers, other younger Australians, other younger Aussies, um, I, you know, I feel for our plight. I, I don't think the rules as they currently stand, um, you know, really go to solve the longer term issues. Um, I don't think the system's sustainable and I think something has to give at some point. Yep, mm. yep. Oh, I'll tell you what has to give priorities and it'll take a government that's got guts to do that. Do you know you young people are paying more tax than what we get out of our petroleum resources rent tax? We have some of, some of the most um, high-rated uh, resources in this country and we're getting more out of you young people by tax than what we are out of mining and petroleum resource rent tax. It comes down to priority and it, has, it comes down to having the guts, knowing very well you're not going to get a political donation off from next time. And that's what it comes down to, it's priority and it should be about our young people and you people are not being put first. And that's what it comes down to and that's the truth of the matter. So yeah, house prices are going to keep... Sorry. Can I just have to do that? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well said. Well said, Jackie. Uh, Norway taxes the oil industry to subsidise university education, to make it free, and to subsidise social housing. Australia does exactly the opposite. And that is your responsibility as a government. Yep. And everything I've heard from you today on this issue is a cop-out. It is your <laughs> responsibility to tax the resource industry to make, you know, just... Do away with hex. It was a terrible reform by the ALP under the Dawkins reforms. It, 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 it was a catastrophe for the universities. The quality of university education has suffered as a result. The buildings are much nicer because <laughs> vice chancellors receive a million mm. bucks mm. in order to be real estate developers yeah. while the levels of university education are plummeting. <laughs> Social housing. You talked about increasing the supply of housing. Absolutely. What are you doing about that? It's not going to increase on its own. You need to build social housing. That's it is exactly really what we're doing. And you're not doing it. No, no. Well, you can say we're not doing it, and that's fine to be living a life fact free. Well, are you doing it? But the reality is that's exactly what we're How many have you to do. Well, we've only just started as okay. a new government. I, I, I <laughs> hope so they so are trying to Hang on a second. We've gone from it isn't happening to it is, but it's not enough. Is that what you're arguing? Or? Well, you haven't done it. Yeah, well, there you no, go. When, and when where are you going to get the money from? Because you're not taxing the resources. All right, let's go to money. Floor. Because, <laughs> Stephanie, you're all about money. And uh, you're... I am all about money. I want to go to your <laughs> modern monetary theory. Give me the elevator pitch of what that means. It means we want to tell the truth about how the monetary system works. We want to be honest about the capacity of a currency-issuing government, like the Australian government, the Japanese government, the British government, the US government, the Canadian government, and so forth and so on and recognize that countries that operate with their own currency, that issue their own currency, do not and cannot operate their budgets like a household, that things simply work differently. And when you talk about governments needing to, quote unquote, find the money, it's as if we think we're still operating on a gold standard and somebody's got to go dig a hole in the ground and, and pull gold out in order to be able to spend money. That's but the issue just... with going into more debt is inflation. That's, hey, well, that's didn't... the issue, isn't okay, it? OK, but I didn't say anything about debt. So far, I'm just trying to have a, like, candid conversation about where the money comes from. So let's understand that in the modern era, when the Australian government decides it wants to spend more, the instructions go to the Reserve Bank, and the only way the government can spend is for the Reserve Bank to change the numbers in the bank account so that the, the deposits increase and the money is created. It's not like there's some other way for it to work. There's only one way for this to work. Government says it wants to spend. The Reserve Bank carries out the payments on behalf of government, and it does so using nothing more than a computer keyboard changes the numbers up in the bank accounts, new money is created. We can all take a deep breath knowing that the government can't run out of money, but it can run out of things to buy. So inflation is the thing you've got to worry about, not insolvency, not bankrupting your country. There is no national credit card. We need to have a grown-up conversation. OK. Joe, do we need to print more money? Well, well as Do Dr Kelton just said, inflation is the thing we need to worry about, and it, 
in printing more money causes inflation. No, it um, doesn't. Well, OK. Uh, then I'm wrong. Um, well, <laughs> sure, because we... It can, can't it? It can. I mean, it could, well, it spending, could. not it printing. Could. Not print, there's no other way for it to work. So I, I've just explained. There is only one way for the government to spend. Can the government spend too much? Yes, of course. We can have, in total, too much spending in the economy. The economy doesn't have the capacity, maybe, to keep up with all that demand. And you get some increase in prices, sure. But, you know, we spent the better part of a decade before COVID with people saying governments were printing money, the U.S. was printing money, Japan was printing money, and the U.K. was printing money, everybody was printing money, and there was no inflation. For a decade in the U.S., a decade across the Eurozone, three decades in Japan, printing, 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 no inflation to show for it. So inflation finally showed up, not because anybody printed any money, but because COVID showed up mm. and broke supply chains. And then the, the inflation was the natural consequence. Okay. Especially given after 15 years of zero investment in Europe and in the United, or very little investment in the United States, so supply had been constrained because we were not investing all this time. But 100% of the inflation was not supply side. No, but everyone who's looked at this, at least in the US context, uh, context, but look at the ECB, look at people who've done the autopsy, that go back and really do detailed analysis and say, where did this inflation come from that we've experienced over the course of the last three years or so. It came from the supply side. It came from the bottlenecks in production and later from the, you know, war in Ukraine and Russia. It came from energy and food prices. Very little. Look at the San Francisco Federal Reserve. Look at Moody's analytics. Anybody who's done these analysis, the ECB will tell you, look, we haven't even talked about the price gouging. Corporations took advantage of the inflationary environment. They raised prices, so some of it came from there. But very little of the inflation, well, for those who've actually done the work and tried to explain it, will say that it came from governments just simply spending too much. The RBA in Australia mm -hmm. said that between... They modelled it in different ways, but between a third and a half of the inflation outbreak in Australia was demand-side, not... As an economist, side. may I make a point? Sure. Look into these models. They are a little, bit, a little bit like sausages. If you know what's in them, you don't want to touch them. You know... Th <laughs> <laughs> the Ed Husick on the big question. I think he's used that one before. <laughs> it still works well. <laughs> it's, a, it's pretty good. But on, good on inflation, price gouging, I mean, the government has been arguing that, it, that a lot of it is actually coming from the supply side as well, right? Oh, there's been an, uh, definitely an element of uh, immediately post-COVID, there was uh, certainly that. Um, we've also uh, looked at and had concerns, and I, again, I see it in my own community when people are going to supermarkets, shopping, what they're getting in the basket versus um, what they used to be able to get for the same amount of money, and that's why we've um, said we need to have an increased focus and had the ACCC looking at, for example, uh, what's happening on that side, where it directly affects people mm. Uh, in the street, as it were. So there are, are those areas. I think the, the difficulty in terms of what... You know, I appreciate what Stephanie was, was saying. I think the, the issue will be that governments around the world, I think you appreciate, are concerned about where inflation's at. Still, yeah. you know, some of it's moderating, not moving fast enough. Um, we're seeing it stabilise here. Uh, and the issue will be just to, to see that, actually, that fight end yeah. uh, and see uh, inflation come down. Now I'd like to bring in Shravan Nagesh. Uh, thanks, Patricia. So with the holy month of uh, Ramadan underway, a time of fasting, prayers and coming together for the Muslim community, is this the appropriate time, as mentioned by Mr Albanese, and possibly the best opportunity for the government to resume funding for the UNRWA? Yes, yeah, so UNRWA, that's the aid agency for Palestinians. Ed Husek, I might start with you there. Uh, well, the biggest thing um, that needs to be front and centre here is that um, children over there are starving in, in Gaza. Uh, people are without food, water, medicine, uh, and there is a concern of a further uh, loss of life as a result of Israel's military operations uh, in, in Gaza. Um, we've had that suspension of funding. We are working hard and we do need to see funding resumed. Uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, UNRWA doesn't just supply humanitarian aid, it's responsible for the functioning of community in, in Gaza. And, uh, you know, there are decisions being made, either suspending um, help to Gaza, seeing Israel's military operations there and the impact that's had 
on lives lost, uh, estimated 31,000 plus and nearly 73,000 uh, injured. Um, this is, uh, we, we do need to get this restored as quickly as possible. Uh, and you want it restored funding. to UNRWA? Uh, well, once the, we've got to go through the investigations and see what they say, but that needs to happen as quickly as possible. Because the government's looking at other options. There's a push just this afternoon, I'm sure you've seen the stories, some people saying, um, uh, some of the Israeli lobby groups, that they would like to see the money go towards the floating um, aid, aid um, base, the pier that they've described the US. Would that be appropriate? I, I think the best thing that could happen right now is that Israel actually allows humanitarian aid to go through. That's the thing that's not being discussed uh, adequately. They need to let this happen. But why aren't they? There is, a, there is an unprecedented crisis that is happening there and there are decisions, life and death decisions, that are being made by Israel that need to be dealt with and there needs to be more humanitarian aid going through. And it's not just while we're focused on Gaza, um, there's also in the West Bank. Uh, people are being prevented in terms of their jobs, their incomes, um, they're economically being crippled in that that part uh, as well. That hasn't even been contemplated yet, where people are begging for cash and heating uh, through the course of, of winter. And uh, I think that's another, an, another issue as well that has been missed and needs to be recognised and dealt with. Mm. So you think the responsibility is on Israel? Uh, yeah, in terms of humanitarian aid, absolutely. And much of the uh, international community has been saying this needs to be addressed, that innocent civilians should not be paying the price mm. and they should be able to get the aid flowing through a lot quicker. And the fact that the US has had to get to that stage of talking about that, float, you know, that floating pier uh, demonstrates that um, I think in many respects Israel has refused, refused to listen to what I believe are absolutely not just reasonable but vital calls for people to get the aid that they need. So if Israel's not listening, should they face sanctions and ramifications? Well, I think you're going to see that enter... Uh, it, you'll, you'll see that enter into the public... A debate increasingly. Do you think that we need no, to not, start having not, that conversation? It's not, not up to me to be floating, you know, those type of discussions, but the point for me is to say certainly that we need to see Israel take a different uh, position when it comes to the flow of humanitarian aid. There are at least, you know, seven different points at which that aid could come through, not least of which being through Rafa, um, and that needs to be improved. Yanis, the Australian government has changed its line significantly in the last few months as the death toll has risen, signing a joint agreement with New Zealand and Canada, uh, for instance, calling on Israel not to enter into a ground offensive in Rafa. Mm. There's been a big shift, hasn't there, in the world's response? Nope. Too little, Seven. too late. Yep. The starving children in Gaza are not starving. They are starved intentionally. There is a concerted effort by Israel to starve the population of Gaza. This is not collateral damage. This is an intentional policy. It okay, is well, a they war would crime. Argue, they would argue that the reason the aid's not going in yes. is uh, because Hamas takes the aid and that's the argument they make. What, what's your response to that? That it is evidently not true. That there is a policy, you've just... Lived, you, all you need to do is to listen to Israeli television, to listen to Israeli ministers being very clear that they are not letting aid in as a means of starving the population to submission until Hamas um, lays down their arms, uh, half of the population leave and go to Egypt. By denying this funding to the United Nations uh, the only aid agency that can actually bring aid into Gaza, because you can bring it to the shores of Gaza, but how is it going to be distributed? Mm -hmm. The only agency is that. And denying, defunding it, which is what your government did, on the basis they of an the unsubstantiated... Funding. They paused the funding. Well, th that's yeah. the funding. Yeah? When you have people, kids starving to death, and you pause, you are defunding the amelioration of the starvation of those children. And therefore... In my view, the Australian, the image of Australia has been irreparably damaged by this. And now beginning to fund again an organisation which can't bring the food in because the Israeli Defence Force is not letting them bring it in. Mm. It's not that they're not even letting the Americans bring it in. Mm. This is the time for boycotting, sanctioning and divesting from 
Israel, and we need to do it on behalf of progressive Israelis who are suffocating in Israel as we speak, because they can see that the whole world is looking upon Israel as the source of war crimes. We need to make sure that Israeli progressives and humanists do not continue to flee because they're leaving the country mm -hmm. and they will surrender the country to the, the zealots and the ultra-Zionists who will make Israel uninhabitable. Jackie Lambie, at the start of this crisis, you gave a powerful speech to the parliament. You were very um, concerned about the Hamas attack, as a lot of people have been and should be. Five months into this conflict, what are your reflections? Do you think uh, Israel's gone too far? Uh, I think Israel is starting to annoy a lot of people out there. <laughs> oh, they're sitting right on the line. Are they about to go over it if they don't you do something? You don't think something? they've crossed it yet? Um, I will just say they're right on that line. I think this has been going on for too long. The problem is you do have terrorists, and terrorists um, are bastards. There's no other way to put that. Anywhere that has terrorists, you will have... Um, uh, uh, destabilisation uh, through your country. There is no doubt about that when you have a group, when you have a large group of them. That's my first thing. My, my second point is this. We have a thing out there, it's called United Nations. OK, we have soldiers out there that wear blue caps. Now, I'd like to see Israel take out one of them when they're on the ground passing out food. Why aren't we talking about putting peacekeepers over there at these checkpoints, neutral countries that are not involved, OK, to make sure this food is getting delivered. Why aren't we doing that? Nobody's talking about this. And I don't see a reason why not. We can't, we, they haven't got months and months those kids over there, all, those, all the adults or anyone on that Gaza Strip. It needs to be done tomorrow. I would like to see United Nations talking about bringing those blue hats in there on that Gaza Strip. Cos I'd like to see bloody Israel try and take one of them out. OK? Joe Biden will veto it again, as he's vetoed every move towards a humanitarian direction since the beginning. There's it's the United States no. vetoing and dragging well, the rest of the West along with them. Well, the rest of the West needs to stand on its own two feet. Yeah. Is that, is that a viable option? The one that's been proposed? I mean, I don't, this is sort of beyond the scope of uh, my area of expertise, but it certainly seems like a viable option. This is a, an absolute humanitarian disaster. Yeah. Every day that passes is another day of lost lives. And I, I mean, there's no, there's no doubt but that there is an urgent need to act on this, to bring this to an end. Plenty to get to tonight. Here's Gordon Catelby. Good evening, everybody. Um, my question is uh, about the US elections. Uh, very sort of contemporary thing this year. Is Trump support less than portrayed? Are there a whole block of rusted on Republicans who won't vote for Trump for reasons such as the abortion changes, his attack on democracy on the 6th of January, Ukraine and other antics? Is this block large enough to keep him out of office? Stephanie. So there are some Republicans who are what they call never Trumpers. They voted for him once and they have vowed that they will not do it again. Some are turning to uh, RFK Jr. as an alternative to Donald Trump. Uh, I think with women, there is something uh, possibly stronger when you say, are we underestimating or overestimating the appeal of Donald Trump? The abortion issue really does resonate with women, including Republican women. And I know some of them, and I know some of them for whom this issue uh, is pushing them into the Joe Biden camp. So at the end of the day, you know, our political system is so complicated, the Electoral College, and I mean, it really isn't a two-way race. It really is uh, this third-party candidate, uh, RFK Jr., is polling anywhere between 20 and 30 percent, depending on the poll that you look at. So any, anything can happen, really. And it, I think it largely comes down to um, how many votes RFK Jr. is pulling from Trump versus Biden. And the way the Electoral College works, and we've got a handful of swing states, nine really important swing states. The last poll that I saw had Donald Trump leading in eight of the nine. So, anything? Are you really worried that, that um, Donald Trump will win the next election? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
How worried? Very worried. And do you think Joe Biden's the right one to take him on? Well, he's our candidate. I mean, he is the <laughs> candidate to take him on. What so, an, do you what think he can beat him? I, I, I think he can beat him, but again, it, com it comes down to this weird interplay between the, th the three leading candidates and the Electoral College and how you get out the vote in these key... And it comes down to precincts. I mean, Hillary Clinton lost by 83,000 votes. It's, it's narrow, narrow mm. margins, and it becomes, you know, who's got the savviest get-out-the-vote team and works those precincts and figures out at the, uh, you know, at the last moment how the votes are going to stack. You've lived in the US. Do you, what, what do you think of this third candidate business? I lived in California. I didn't live in the US. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never went actually into real America. <laughs> Different country. Um, look, I, I don't. Uh, I, I don't. I have to say, I'm not sufficiently informed really about R, RFK's campaign. But uh, it's pretty obvious uh, that uh, a younger Democratic candidate would have been a very good idea because uh, I think Trump wouldn't be in, in such a strong position if, if, they, if the Democratic Party had been prepared to... and President Biden had been able to make the right decision for the country. Giannis? I think he's completely indeterminate. It's impossible to predict. Uh, and sometimes it's important to be able to, you know, confess that we don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's good to yeah. say that you don't actually don't know. know. You can't predict the future. Right. What I do suspect is that Biden has lost more of his core youth vote because of Gaza compared to the Republicans that Trump has lost due to abortion. I'm not happy about this. I'm simply stating it as a... Observation. Est estimation. But what I find interesting is that, on the one hand, if you take these issues, you have uh, Joe Biden, who is uh, focusing on Trump's misogyny, on ab abortion, on uh, um, these cultural issues, which are essential to civilized people, in order not to discuss the crushing reality that mm -hmm. both white and black working class people have minuscule income and zero wealth. And that creates a lot of discontent. At the same time, Trump is addressing these people in a way that Biden cannot, because he is so close to Wall Street, so close to the elites. Trump is better at addressing the have-nots in order to usurp their vote and, once in the White House, do what he did the last time, give everything to Wall Street and tax cuts to the super-rich. I think that is the conundrum of the United States. And I think we should all be very happy that in Australia we have compulsory voting. Mm. Because, mm. because at least, you know, you know that everybody's going to vote. Whereas in the United States, it's a question of who is going to abstain with greater probability. Mm. Mm. OK, we always end up really happy about compulsory voting on this show. So let's... <laughs> round of applause for... Yeah, for... Honestly, it's just like, make, it gives us a feel-good moment. And we can bring you the results of our online poll now. We asked you, should Australian regulators attempt to curb the economic and political power of big tech companies like Meta? More than 3,300 of you responded. Here's how you voted. 84% of you say yes. 9% said no and 7% are unsure. I think that's an overwhelming number. Next, we'll hear from Ryan Young. Hi. Uh, I'm from a bathroom and plumbing supplies retailer who sells products made in Germany and Italy. Mm. These products are made in countries with similar wages, unionism and costs associated with manufacturing these products. Why then does a country who has made a fortune digging valuable resources up from the ground does not have the capacity to make these same products here, particularly given the reduced freight cost to the consumer of homegrown products compared to those made in countries like mm. Europe? That's a really interesting question. You're the minister mm. of the industry. <laughs> and that's our big, big focus. I mean, coming out of the pandemic, and we've spoken about it uh, through the course of the show tonight, um, you know, the things that we needed most weren't there when we needed them. Uh, and that was a pretty important lesson uh, for us, the impact of supply chains and geopolitics, the way that that's operated. And obviously the other big challenge of our time is climate change and the need to reduce emissions. And I think we can mobilise Australian industry to be part of that, and that's why we are focused uh, especially on making sure that we are a country that makes things. It creates not only the products that we need in those key areas, we can't do everything, but we will be focused on 
on key areas. We've got to be able to do more in value adding, like we, in terms of what we have with resources. We have the greatest store of critical minerals on the planet, and yet we don't really do the extra step of the value add uh, with respect to there. Uh, but also across medical sciences uh, and obviously energy and emissions uh, and emerging capabilities and technology as well, where we have a lot of smart people here in this country who feel, for whatever reason, that they're just not getting the support or interest and leave our shores to chase what they want to do elsewhere. So from our point of view, being able to be a country that makes things, uh, that we sharpen our technology edge and through that, that we create really good, secure uh, long-term jobs as well, well-paying jobs, uh, that is a big focus for us. And is it going to be easy to sort out? No. Like, I'm not coming here saying we're going to fix this in one term. We've had uh, big, in terms of global shifts around manufacturing and also within manufacturing, the nature of it uh, itself. Uh, but it is something that I think is important and certainly our government thinks important uh, longer term to do exactly the type of things you're asking in terms of the question of being able to have... Uh, our own products when we need them. I think uh, there's a very simple question. Uh, sorry, very simple answer to your question. <clears throat> if you're a German uh, manufacturer, you have uh, huge trade openness with the entire European continent. You're talking about 400 million households. I'm yeah. um, probably maybe uh, give or take. Here, you, you've got your potential customers are 15 million households, and the, the scale benefits of of that we just can't compete. It's that simple. And now, I, I, which is why a big Australia is a very good idea. Um, the problem is, <laughs> when we talk about housing, um, as we continue to grow the population, we can't keep up with the housing supply and that drives up the price of assets. So, so it's, it's very complicated, but I mean, there's a, a lot of A big Australia that keeps up on the infrastructure front. Is well, it possible? Uh, uh, look, good question. I, I would, it's a bit like, can Trump win the election? I would not want to predict uh, the future. But I, I certainly think that there are huge benefits to be unlocked for the, the Australian economy if we go, uh, continue to really aggressively grow the population. But yeah, we, we, we have to think about the downsides as well. Jackie, big population? Um, I don't think we can handle big population right now, that's for sure. You can take uh, more got, people I've in Tassie. Our Australia, we've got no homes down there either, mate. Okay, so <laughs> that's the problem we have. We've got plenty of homeless out in the streets. So it would be very unfair for me to say to other Australians, yes, we should, we should be asking more, a lot more people to come in here when we can't accommodate what's already here. I think that's rubbish. But also something about what you were saying. Yeah, make Australia make again, that'd be fabulous. You know, I had to have a bit of a giggle. Make Australia make again. Yeah, I had to, I had to have a bit of a giggle today about your um, tariffs of, um, you know, $30 million you're gonna be able to make out of that. Because apparently your, I think it was your treasurer was talking about chopsticks, which I found very amusing. So we've learnt nothing out of COVID because apparently we can't even make chopsticks here in this country. Are we Go importing figure. them? And toothbrushes. Yes. Toothbrushes yeah. too. Stephanie? Sorry, can I, sorry, can I yep. just, just jump in very, very quickly? Um, the, the complex menu, like the stuff that we need to make in particular, like for instance, you know, if it's a choice between chopsticks and say, for example, the next vaccine or the next thing that cures cancer or the next thing that... Like, I, I tell you, we, we should be putting our eggs more in that basket. That's what we're trying to do. Like valuable things. Exactly. Th but... Those type of things. Um, and we can't necessarily just, we, you know, Joe is right, we can't just rely on our population, but the reality is we are also, you know, we have set up trading relationships, particularly within our region and other countries where our products are rated, and we do need to be able to bolt on markets through that. And for us to give up, I'm not saying that's necessarily the way that you were putting it, but the reality is we've had heaps of people say over the years, we just can't do manufacturing. And we've seen other countries be able to do manufacturing. And with the fact that we've, while we might have a small population, we've got strong trading relationships, means we can make it here and ship it everywhere. And that's where, where our head should be. I just don't think we've learnt anything out of COVID at all. We had to wait for supplies to come in. Uh, God help us if, if we need to go up there and, and protect our country because there's not enough weapons, there's hardly any rounds here. Uh, we've got enough fuel to last us two or three days. All that's going on, by the way, just so you know. So. Um, I'm not so sure, and sooner or later that unemployment rate's going to sneak back up. And I tell you what, there's a lot more jobs in manufacturing than what there is in making medicines. And I don't have a problem with you doing that, but you should be able to do both. Mm. European example, big market. Is that why we can't make stuff here? Well, OK, you mentioned Germany, manufactured goods. Here in Australia, we gave up our manufacturing. It won't be easy 
to start manufacturing final goods again. Uh, and it would be futile to try to do it in one go. But what we can do in this country is this. Take Europe. Europe is about to introduce a border adjustment carbon tax, which means that Chinese electric vehicles going to Europe are going to face a tariff because, the, you know, they are nickel and cobalt inside the batteries and so on is produced using brown technologies, not green technologies. What Australia could do, because we have vast areas, arid areas, you can just fill them with solar panels, it's just a major new renewables expansion program for the purposes of creating green hydrogen, not to export it, you cannot export it in large distances, that is crazy, uh, in order to, to re create plants for a refining cobalt, copper from South Australia, iron, steel, uh, nickel, to refine it and make it green before you sell it to the Chinese, to put it into their cars to avoid the adjustment. So the, the, I'm giving you an example of the kind of green industrial revolution that Australia can participate in, but that requires a government that has the courage to do it. It will take something like the investment of the Snowy scheme, you know, big government public investment for the purposes of, you know, ditching fossil fuels, creating renewables and use them to create a new intermediate manufacturing base. Nothing else will work. That would work. And that's all we have time.